Well, good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you all here uh, this morning. Um, it is great to uh, take some time out in the midst of a big, busy week and uh, hopefully just kind of take a breath and maybe uh, connect with and hear from the Lord. I, I imagine for some of you all, uh, this might be the only time in your week when you actually do that, when you take a break from the chaos that surrounds um, you. Part of, of what we're, we're going to look at today is how do you respond to the chaos that surrounds you? When you're in the midst of those moments, you're in the midst of those times where it seems like it's coming from you from all sides, from work, from family to relationships and money and and it's just like, uh, and the world seems to be falling apart, whether you're here in the United States or, or maybe you're, you know, somewhere else in the world where there's a lot more pressure when there's genocide and wars and, and famine. And what, how do we respond when chaos surrounds us? And, and Christ is going to, in essence, kind of answer this question in the midst of Mark 13. But for those of you who were here last week, remember I told you if you wanted to see a pastor squirm to come back? Well, you came back. If you're new here, let me just up front say I'm sorry. Uh, only because this is, this is, this is going to be a different kind of message than we, than we usually talk to, just because of the nature of the passage. Now, we're going through Mark. We've been through a series We've gone pretty much from the beginning to the end. We kind of skipped over chapter 13, so we can do a concentrated time on it. Um, and here we are in chapter 13. And last week, we looked at, um, at what it means to respond to uncertain future. And Jesus pretty much said, don't worry about the future, focus on the now. Uh, but they did ask him a question, if you remember, in the beginning of Mark. And the question that they asked him in the beginning of Mark, he had said that the temple was going to come down. And they asked him, when was this going to happen, and what are the signs? And the first part of his answer really didn't answer that at all. All, all he was really basically saying is, don't worry about it. But the second part of the answer that we're going to get to today does. The only thing is, that answer will make absolutely no sense if you don't understand the context. The problem is, is the context is the book, the entire book of Daniel. So, now don't worry, I'm not going to keep you here till noon, but I do, I do want to just take a, a, more than a few minutes, but a little bit of time and give you the context so you understand what's going on when we get there in Mark. So, if you have a Bible, we're actually not going to spend a whole lot of time actually in the details, details, but if you have a Bible and you just kind of want to follow along, you can open up your Bibles to the uh, book of Daniel if you don't have a Bible, you can borrow one of ours that's in the seat in front of you, um, and uh, you're welcome to do that, or you're welcome just to listen, listen along. Would somebody, if you, when you get to Daniel, just tell me what page number that is? In the, 625. 625. It's page 625 um, in the book of Daniel. All right, so are you, are you ready? This is one you want to buckle in for, okay? This is one you want to buckle in for. So uh, here's the timeline. I'm sorry that it... it Probably it's not as readable to those of you in the back. So um, just we'll go with the pictures. This right here is the creation, okay? This is when God created the world. Um, and this is a part, just, just ignore everything uh, really from, from this part this way, because this is us. And this would, not, this would not be part of the Jewish understanding in Jesus' time of, of what's going on. And, and we want to understand what, what they're understanding of, of what's happening, okay? So just forget that we're, you're alive today and there's a future and all the stuff that you know about what may or may not happen in the future, okay? So we're just going to back the, if you would, back the truck up. And in history, in, in, uh, in the history of the God's Word, there's highs and there's lows. After creation... Um, which was the ultimate fall because we were separated from God by relationship. Probably the, the, the biggest low after that was the flood, right? Where, where everything's flooded. And then um, the high would be Abraham. 
God comes to Abram and says, not only does he uh, establish a relationship with Abraham, but he says, from you, this hero, which was promised at creation, is going to come. Um, he's also called the Messiah. He later will be called the Anointed One. He's a little, lot of different names. But, a, but in essence, he promised Abraham that he's going to have many children that becomes the, uh, the uh, Israelites. And that uh, he, from his seed, this hero would come. Um, from there, his family ends up in Egypt. Um, we have, he has a son, Isaac, who has a son, Jacob, uh, who actually has 12 sons. They all end up in slavery in Egypt. And then uh, God delivers them from Egypt, and they end up um, at Mount Sinai, and they're given the law. That's the Ten Commandments, right? That's the, the basic essence of, what, of what, uh, what it means to try to be good. The Ten Commandments, just an example, there's actually 625 different commandments. But the Ten Commandments are in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures. But that's the, kind of the heart of it, if you, if you would. And then, of course, after this, they... Um, um, don't do so well, and Judges 21-25 probably sums up, they're following God, but in the end, it says everyone does what's best in their own mind. It, they're, in other words, they become good Americans, okay? <laughs> and so uh, every, whatever makes them happy is what they do. And, and that's actually interesting enough, that's the ultimate uh, statement of judgment, not of, oh, they arrived, from there, a uh, king is, is chosen, and the best king in the height of the uh, Israeli nation is during, during David. That's the kingdom right here. Okay? It, it had its, its largest territory, its, its best peace. David himself uh, uh, follows God pretty closely. He has some major hiccups, actually, along the way. But um, um, God forgives him, and he, God actually describes David af, af, as a man after his own heart. Solomon builds the temple... This, that's his son, and they do all right kind of during his lifetime, but from, from the end of Solomon's lifetime, because he marries so many wives with, uh, that worship foreign gods, down, you have the slippery slope where Israel more and more becomes unfaithful and faithful and faithful and faithful. And then, and then during this time, God sends prophets, people to tell them in the future, if you don't start being faithful, I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to judge you by the nations around you. Sometimes they're faithful, most of the times they're not. And so ultimately, they end up where a nation takes them. There's the kingdom divides. There's the northern Israel and southern Israel. The northern kingdom is taken by the Assyrians. And then the, and then the southern kingdom, um, and by the way, the, let me just, the northern kingdom is made up of 10 tribes because there's 12 families. 10 of those made up the northern kingdom. We have no clue what happened to them. So the Jews that you know of today are from one of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Because those are the tribes of Judah. They're the only ones that we actually know their history of. The other ten tribes got absorbed into Assyria, and we, and we know nothing about them. Okay? Now, there are groups of people that pop up in other places that we think somewhere back along the line connect because of their, you know, they, they're kosher. They go by the Ten Commandments kind of an issue. But, but we have no history of those ten tribes. The history that we know of, both biblically and even historically, is of the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And that's what happens here um, um, when Babylon finally comes and King Nebuchadnezzar is the leader of Babylon at the time. This is in your history books, by the way. Not, this is not just the Bible, but in your history books. And he uh, lays, a, lays siege to Jerusalem and takes it captive. Daniel lived in Jerusalem during that time. He was a kid, probably early teens at best. He was captured. Uh, he belonged uh, probably to a noble family, so his family was well-educated, well-established. And he was taken away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Okay? So this is where we are in the history. Are you following me so far? The reason that is important is because whenever for a Jew, okay, I, we need, I'm trying to get you in a Jewish mindset. For, for a Jew, whenever we end up in times of, especially when we're foreign occupancy, right, not only do we go back to God's word, because for, for a Jew, God's word is the ultimate. It is the ultimate. If you've ever watched a Fiddler on the Roof, 
right? Where he's singing, if I were a rich man. <laughs> right? And he goes through all these things. But, but in the middle of that song, he gets really quiet and he says, all day long, he'd sit in the synagogue and debate the scriptures. And that, he says, would be the sweetest thing of all. There's nothing sweeter for, uh, uh, for uh, a believer in Yahweh, for a Jewish believer in Yahweh, than to spend time and understand God's word. And the reason that Daniel is such a powerful book, even today, by the way, uh, uh, it, with all these enemies surrounding Israel, is because the book of, the book of Daniel is a, is a great um, reminder. Even though the Jews were taken into captivity, their power, quote-unquote, was taken from them, their city was taken from them, their temple was destroyed where they worshiped God, Daniel is a book that says God is still God and my people are still my people. It, it, and, and that's it's one of the interesting things about Jewish history. If you ever study Jewish history, and I'm not just talking about the Hebrew scriptures, I'm talking about secular Jewish history, even in the last 2,000 years. One of the things about Jews is, is uh, um, no matter how much they've been put down, no matter how much they've been abused, they come out, um, with a, still a sense of pride. And, and part of that is, part of that, the reason is, is that um, the reason that they're not successfully stripped of their identity like some other nationalities have been throughout history that have been put in similar situations is because they have this innate belief based on scriptures that if something bad happens to us, it got nothing to do with you. It's our fault. God is just punishing us, and as soon as we get our act together, you're out and we're back. And there's nothing you can do or say to change that, because we're God's people. No matter what happens to us, we're God's people. <laughs> That's not in the text, by the way. <coughs> um, and so, th- so that's why the book of Daniel is so important to them. All right, so I'm, I just want to march you through really quickly the book of Daniel, and it's going to be quick, okay? I'm, I met it right, right up hand. It's going to be quick, okay? The first part of Daniel, chapters 1 through 6, are really telling the story of Daniel's life, but more importantly, what it's telling is, is that God is still God, even when they're being foreignly occupied, that he is still preeminent over every king and every other god. So the story starts out in chapter 1 with Daniel and a bunch of others being deported from Jerusalem. The only people they left were the uneducated, poorest of the poor, just to work the land in order to send the best of the land back to Babylon. Anyone of any education, almost every single male, um, uh, definitely anyone of royalty, anyone of any sign of leadership was deported to Babylon. Because you want it again. You want the fruits of the land, but you don't want any rebellion. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So in chapter 1, Daniel and his friends are deported. And, and the, the uh, king decides, you know what? I want to educate. I want, I want special people in my court. And I want the best of the best. Not only of Babylonians, Babylonians, but of these nations that we've conquered as well. And so Daniel and three friends... Um, are chosen to be educated and uh, to serve somewhere in the leadership of, of, of Babylon. It's a great way to kind of assimilate them and to get their allegiance to you. The only problem is, is that when they show up for training, they're told uh, to eat unkosher food. And in the, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, you might have Jewish friends today who probably, you know, eat bacon. Um, but... But for strict Jews, even today, and definitely Jews back then, there, you did, there was food you did not eat, and it was a lot larger than just bacon. And all this kind of food was on the king's table. And so, long story short, Daniel goes to the guy in charge and says, hey, we can't eat this. And the guy says, hey, Daniel, I like you, but if you guys don't show up healthy and strong, and I'm going to be the one in trouble with the king, not you. And Daniel says, let's do a test. We'll eat kosher for 10 days, and uh, if we're healthier and stronger, 
then we can continue to do so. If not, then we'll go ahead and eat your food. Well, they do that, and, not, and they are much healthier and stronger, so then everybody goes on the kosher diet. And, and the chapter ends with the king assessing them and saying Daniel and his friends were head and shoulders, not just physically, but even in their wisdom above everybody else. Okay? Chapter 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He's the king. He's the man who, who took over Jerusalem and then that whole region. Again, you could read about this in your history books. Not the dream, but the history of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he turns to his, his wise guys, and he says, I had a dream. Tell me what it is and interpret it. And they can't. Now, they can interpret it as soon as he tells them what the dream is. You, you know how that works, right? It, uh, it's kind of like the palm reader. If you've ever been one, they got lots of information for you, but they need some basic information first, right? In this case, he just shows up and says, tell me the dream and then tell me the interpretation. And no one can. He's, he's so livid that he decrees that every wise guy, anyone who gives counsel um, is, to be, is to be killed and their family as well. Well, word gives out to Daniel and his friends, and Daniel goes before God, and he prays. God gives him the vision. Daniel shows up. He says, King, this is what you saw. And go ahead and just show the next picture. He saw something like this statue. We have no clue what the statue looked like. But he saw something like this statue. The head was made of gold. The uh, arms and torso were, uh, were silver. And then this is bronze. And then uh, iron and then a mix of iron and clay were the feet, okay? And, and Daniel told him that. And all Daniel tells him in this chapter is that the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar himself and that the rest of these represent kingdoms that will follow. Now, let me tell you, I'm not going to go through all the details in Daniel. For, so, for some of you who are like, oh, I never understood this. I'm glad he's going to go over this. I'm not going to go over all the details, okay? Because of time, and we're really in Mark, not in Daniel, Okay? But I'll kind of give you a hint here. Daniel's best read with the Bible in one hand and actually a history book in the other. Okay? So this is what our history books will tell us. After Nebuchadnezzar, the Medo-Persian uh, Empire came, and they conquered the Babylonians. It was uh, uh, led by a guy named Cyrus. The interesting thing is this. Cyrus is a real, real guy in real history that came at a real time, point in time, after Daniel, Isaiah the prophet wrote, wrote centuries, centuries before Cyrus, and in his prophecy said Cyrus would be the one to allow the Jews to return. And guess what? He did. And that's in your history books. Not the prophecy, of course, but that Cyrus did that. Then come the, the uh, Greek Empire led by Alexander the Great. Then, of course, the Roman Empire. This right here, this is up for debate. I, you can just scratch this one out. This is just kind of came with the picture, okay? We're not too sure what this is. I'll explain a little bit this. But this part right here, of course, when Daniel wrote this down, nobody knew any of these things, right? Except for, the, except for the, this was Nebuchadnezzar. But sure enough, this is exactly what happened. Are you, are you following me? So Daniel interprets this dream and just tells Nebuchadnezzar this is what it means. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar... Um, promotes him and says, your God is amazing. But then we go to chapter 3. In chapter 3 of Daniel, uh, this is a story, if you were raised in the church, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? And if you grew up in the time that I grew up, it was always Shadrach, Horshach, and Abednego. And so, yeah, for those of you laughing, you know. All right. If you didn't laugh, it's all right. It's all right. Um, Anyhow, uh, this is where King Nebuchadnezzar basically says, he sets, he's, he's convinced he's the king, he's the greatest. He sets up an image and says, worship me. Common during that time and era. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these, they were renamed those three names, by the way, refused to. The king is livid that they won't uh, worship the statue because it makes him look bad. So he has them thrown into a fiery furnace. The guys who throw them in die. It is so hot. But the three not only don't die, but when they look in the fire, they're like, wait, didn't we throw three guys in there? I see four. And one looks like an angel. We, by the way, don't have any clue who that fourth one is, though we do have a clue. But it doesn't say specifically who it is. And then he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out. And they come out, and not only, not only do they come out unburnt, un, uh, 
But it says their clothes weren't singed. They didn't even smell of smoke. Nothing. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar once again goes, your God is the God. You catching the theme here? In chapter, in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. It's about a, a big oak. And he sends out, again, uh, I need this interpretation. Daniel shows up. He knows Daniel's the one by now. Daniel shows up and says, King, you really don't want to know the answer to this one. And the king says, yes, I do. And Daniel says, well, here it is. This big oak is you. And all, all these animals and everything were underneath the branches, but then the tree dies. It's cut off except for the stump. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you've made yourself so great in your own eyes that you are going to be humbled before God. And 12 months later, that's exactly what happens, is he's walking on the top of his roofs, and he looks out and says, look at everything I've done. And at that moment, he goes insane. And, he's, and he's, he's cast out, and he actually eats grass, and he has all this kind of stuff. Now, by the way, this is historical. You can go to your history books. You can Wikipedia, if you trust Wikipedia. And you can find out that this Nebuchadnezzar did go bonkers. And then he was restored, just like Daniel said he would be. Which is, by the, by the way, everybody, uh, historians look at the book of Daniel and go, he must have written some other time because he's way too accurate. <laughs> Very interesting. Anyhow, so again, God is God. Then um, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's son is Belshazzar. That's chapter 5. What happens in chapter 5 is Belshazzar gathers all the, uh, he's having a party. And he's trying to impress his friends. This always, by the way, gets you in trouble. Uh, And he has the gold and silver implements from the temple brought in, and they drink wine out of it, and they worship the gods of gold and silver. And all of a sudden, a hand shows up, and it writes these these words on the wall, just a hand. I mean, this is a Hollywood movie right here. Shows up, right? And they, of course, freak out, and they're like, is there, he says, I, someone needs to come and tell me what this means. And of course, nobody can do it, and someone says, I know someone who can. They're not one of our guys. They're one of our captive guys. And so they bring in Daniel, and Daniel says, I don't want any of the stuff that you have to offer me, but I'll tell you what it means. What it means is this. You basically, this is my summary. You ticked God off. You're out. And the Medo-Persian Empire is in. That evening, the Medo-Persians show up, take over the city, and Belshazzar is taken out. Okay, that's chapter 5. In chapter 6... Darius, who was, who was in charge of this area by the Medo-Persians, he was part of the party that came in. He's now leading that area where Daniel is. Uh, again, this is a story that many of you are probably uh, familiar with. Um, Darius likes Daniel, but his advisors once again say, hey, you know what? You are the king of this area. You're the man. Why don't you issue a decree that says nobody can pray to or worship anyone but you for a certain amount of days? And they know... They know what's going to happen. They know that Daniel prays three times a day faithfully. And so they get the the king to decree this. They catch Daniel praying, which everybody knew he would be. And the the consequence is you're thrown into a den of lions. Daniel spends the evening with the lions, has a comfortable night's sleep. The next uh, morning he comes out. Darius goes, your God is the amazing God. And the guys that accuse Daniel get thrown in. And before it says they could even hit the floor, the lions have devoured them. Once again, even in the midst of their captivity, God is good. And then it ends with, chapter 6 ends with, Daniel served right up to the time of Cyrus. So he served all these different leaders. You follow me? Okay, that's the history of Daniel. It's important. It is important because it is a sign that God is in control even when it seems he's not there. Now, chapter 7 through 12 are mind-scratching a bit, okay? But they're important because it's what the Jews hold on to. It's part of this this whole restoration theme. So again, I want to march you really quickly through 7 through 12, okay? In 7, Daniel has a dream of four different beasts. Now, this, okay, this is where it gets tricky. Up to now, we were chronological. This is Daniel's life, started with Nebuchadnezzar, all the way through uh, King Cyrus, who, by the way, is the one who lets the Jews go home, okay? 
Now, starting in seven, we kind of he kind of says during that time, during that history, these things happened. So chapter seven actually starts out during the first year of the reign of Belshazzar. That's the guy who took the implements out of the temple and, the, and with the handwriting on the wall. So the, his dad, Nebuchadnezzar's died. He's taken over, and the first year, Daniel gets his vision. And this vision is four different beasts, animals, okay? The, um, the first is a lion that has the wings of an eagle. The second is a, a bear. He's raised up on one side, and he has three ribs in his mouth. The, the third is, um, second, third, is a leopard that has four heads and has four wings. And then the last one is a frightening beast. He doesn't even say what kind it is, but he has large iron teeth. He devours everyone. He's different from all of the foreign beasts, and he has ten horns. Again, you can kind of go, uh, go back through and look at these the, um, and see all these different kingdoms that this represents. And even, even right down to the detail of it, it had wings, it had iron teeth, really tell you about um, the, uh, the empires that follow. This is all about, just like the statue, the empires that, that uh, follow, including all those ones I just mentioned, Medo-Persian, Greece, Rome, so on and so forth. All right? In Daniel 8, okay, in Daniel 8, he has a vision of a ram and a goat. Same thing. This is in the third year of Belshazzar. So the first vision was in the first, it was the first year he reigned. The, the second vision is in the third year of that guy, of Belshazzar's reign. And it, it simply is this, um, um, and the, the angel, he actually asked the angel for the interpretation. The angel gives him um, the uh, uh, vague interpretation. So the angel tells him that the ram is the Medes and the Persians. So Cyrus hasn't come yet, because this is the third year of Belshazzar. They're just about to come. So Daniel already knows ahead of time that the Medes and the Persians are coming. And in this one, they're represented by the ram. And then the goat that comes with the one long horn is what it says. This goat has one long horn. He takes out the ram. This is Greece. The interesting thing is the one long horn is Alexander the Great. In the vision, the horn is cut off. And four little horns grow out of that. And guess what happened when Alexander the Great died? Four le- this is history now. This is history. Four leaders took over. They were weak. Okay, this is, you, you can read this in your history books. The interesting thing is in Daniel's vision, out of these four, it says that there was, a, there was another really small horn that grew up and all of a sudden was really weak and took over all the others. And guess what happens in history? One of those leaders, his name is Antichus, actually grows, he gets stronger, slow, he's, he's nothing. He's not royalty, he's not, and by, all this is in Daniel. He grows up and he takes over. okay. He takes over. Now, I want to, if you have your Bibles now, I'm going to read a verse out of chapter 8, verse 13. It says this. Um, After he sees this vision, he says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? Okay? In other words, for this, because this last one he describes, that that little horn that becomes a big one, not only is it, it, it attacks the beautiful land, that's Jerusalem. Okay? And here's the question. It says, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary and the hosts that will be trampled underfoot. Because in that, in that vision, something happens to God's people. So there's a parenthesis. Wait a second. How long, how, how's that going to happen? And what's, I just want you to take note in verse 13 of that thing, the rebellion that causes desolation. There's going to be a rebellion by this leader that causes a desolation of the temple. Okay? Are you following me so far? Here's the interesting thing about Antichus. Antichus was an evil guy. And this is history, by the way. Okay? Not just, this isn't from the Bible. This is history. He was an evil guy. And he particularly did not like the Jews. And they, they revolted. And Antichus came in and he... Uh, not only slayed all the priests and all the, uh, um, a lot of the folks in Jerusalem, he went into the temple and he sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple. Okay? 
he desolated the temple. What happened at that point, this was about 165 BC. Okay, what happened? I'm I'm talking about history now. Okay, here's history. At that point, um, there was a revolt. We call it the Maccabean Revolt. Again, you can Wikipedia this. Okay? And uh, some Jews rose up and they fought against him. They fought against him. And um, they, he died and they, they regained Jerusalem. When they went back in the temple, they needed to purify it. One of the first things they needed to do was to set up the candles inside the Holy of Holies to burn. They were able to find one little thing of oil um, to burn. And it had to be purified. It had to be prepared a special way. Only one that would last a day. And they started using it for a day. It took them eight days to find to replenish that oil. The one day supply lasted for eight days. Today, every year, your Jewish friends celebrate Hanukkah. It's called the Festival of Lights. That's why. Because when the Maccabeans came back and retook the temple and purified it, that one day of oil lasted eight days. So Hanukkah is eight days long. The reason I'm I'm stopping and explain this to you is because I want you to see this isn't isn't just um, stories. This is rooted in history. And the more and the more and more people try to pick this apart, you know, a um, hundred years ago, they the secularists who didn't believe this said that this was all all fantasy, that none of these things were true. Today, archaeology has proven over ninety five percent of the history of the Bible. Ninety five percent. Now remember, this, this, what we call one book, is not one book. It's 66 books. It's written over, a, over thousands of years, not by one person. It's the only, only real holy scriptures claimed by anyone that can claim that. And it's accurate. And every year, as they keep digging, guess what? It gets more accurate. So they used to question David. They don't question David anymore. They found that he really exists. They questioned Jericho. They found Jericho with the walls actually fell out, not in. Historical. I'm not making this up. You can look it up. They, of course, they're questioning the ark. It's just a matter of time, probably, before they find that. This stuff is history. It's history. That is chapter uh, 8. In chapter 9, uh, this is, chapter 9 is really interesting because it says, it begins with, in the first year uh, of uh, Darius's reign, that's the guy, Daniel on the lines, Darius, um, I understood from scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Jeremiah says that, that there would be a 70 year period. And here's the interesting thing um, the captives were taken from Jerusalem, Daniel was one of these, in 606 BC. Okay? Seventy years later, this lead guy of the Medo-Persian Empire, Cyrus, tells them that they can go back and begin to rebuild in 536 B.C. Guess about how long that is. Seventy years. Daniel sees this coming. And so he, he, he's, he's a few years shy of this somewhere. We're not exactly sure, but somewhere a few years shy of this. And so he goes before God, and it's an interesting prayer because he goes before God and he thanks God for who he is, but then he repents for all the people. And when he's done repenting for for, uh, for the people, he asks for God's mercy, and then the angel Gabriel shows up. And um, in verse 18, actually in verse 18, of chapter 9, Daniel in his prayer says this. He says, Give ear, O God, and hear, open your eyes, and see the desolation of the city. That's his current day, that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but I love this, but because of your great mercy. I'm asking you, I'm asking you to fulfill this prophecy. Let us go back and rebuild our home, not because we finally got it right, God, but because we know you're a God of mercy. Then Gabriel shows up in response, and Gabriel, I I don't have time to to do this, but you can read verses 25 through the end. 
Gabriel basically says, not only is he talking, he says, yes, the temple, Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt, the temple's going to be rebuilt. But he says, he goes on to talk about 70 weeks that are about to come in. And the, and the word weeks isn't really week, it's seven. He's really saying there's going to be 70 sevens. And then the anointed one will come. The interesting thing is he divides it up. He doesn't say 70 weeks. He says 69 weeks. That's like 483 years. And then the anointed one shows up. And then something happens. And then there's seven more uh, uh, sevens. Or seven, I'm sorry, one seven left. That's one week, or in this case, one year. Or seven years, sorry, seven years. The interesting thing is this. Just let me make it as clear as I possibly can. When Cyrus uh, let them go back, approximately 483 years later, Jesus died on the cross. That was the 69 weeks. And you you can read it. He he separates the 69 from the last week. And it's interesting, here in Daniel, he says this. um, After the 62 sevens, the anointed one... The 62, by the way, follows um, um, six others, so it's 69 in total. Um, The anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people, the ruler who will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Daniel's saying the anointed one's going to come, but he's going to be cut off. And then the sanctuary and the city will be destroyed. Well, guess what happened? The anointed one was cut off on the cross. And within a generation the city and the temple were destroyed. That's in Daniel, which was written hundreds of years before Christ. Hundreds of years before Christ. Now, but for the Jew, now here's the important thing. I I jumped ahead, I'm sorry. I want you in the Jewish frame of mind. In the Jewish frame of mind, the Messiah is coming, the anointed one is coming, and it's about, let's say, a 500-year period. All right, I'm, I'm rounding off. Four, it's 490. It's about a 500-year period. So when the Maccabean revolt happens, they're thinking, from that moment on, they're thinking it's time for the anointed one. Because that really fit kind of what Daniel was saying. Matter of fact, many people thought uh, that, that uh, uh, one of the Maccabeans was the Messiah. So from 165 before Christ to the time of Christ, this is why there were so many, Jesus wasn't the only Messiah historically around this time. A lot of people rose up because they were looking for a Messiah. Why were they looking for a Messiah? Because the Bible said it would be 483 years before the Messiah would show up. But of course, the sign of the Messiah for them was this conquering hero. Are you following me? This is a book of expectation. Then Daniel has a vision um, of, a, of, a, of a man in, in chapter 10, um, who, it, it's, again, it's interesting. I don't have time to, to outline it, but the man impresses him himself. In essence, whether it's an angel or Jesus, we're not sure. It's somebody from heaven. But he actually says in verse 12, which makes me think it's probably not Jesus, it's an angel, that when Daniel started praying, that he was on his way, but he was kept from coming because of a battle. Basically, what chapter 10 says is that there is a spiritual battle. There are unseen things happening. This is, by the way, why prayer is such an important thing. And it's not like when you pray something that God isn't answering. It says, as soon as you start praying, I I came in response. God sent me. But I was upheld because there was this spiritual battle, literally. And another angel actually showed up and helped him. This make a great movie. Anyhow, and then chapter 11 and 12 uh, gives us a picture of the Persian Empire again, the Greece Empire and then uh, the e- Egyptian Empire, and then specifically Antiochus in verses 21 through the end of chapter 11. And chapter 12 is all about what's going to happen at the very end, that seventh week, if you would, or that, that last seven years. Are you following me so far? Okay. Let me breathe. <clears throat> Why that is so... Actually, there is one... one thing I want to leave you with out of, uh, out of Daniel, and that is back in uh, chapter 10. I read that uh, um, after 62-7, this is, I'm sorry, chapter 9, I apologize, chapter 9, verse 26. It says, after the 62-7, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. 
The people, the ruler, will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. So now it's talking about the end. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. Remember Jesus' statement last week about don't fall for wars and rumors of wars? That was because part of the end coming was these wars. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Who's the he in this? It's not God. It's, some, it's, some, it's one of these beasts. It's the last beast. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Where's the only place you can put an end to sacrifice and offering? The temple. Okay? And on the wing of the temple, he will set up, here it is, an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay? So in Daniel, it says, in the midst of this end, what's going to happen is this last ruler, this last leader, which is, by the way, why they thought it was Antichus, right, would show up, he would enter the temple, he would stop sacrifice, and not only that, he would desolate it. In other words, he would do something very Gentile, like slaughter a pig, or Revelation really talks about him making himself God, the worship of me rather than of Yahweh. That is the sign. So the Jews, the Jews now, are waiting for the anointed one to come, and they're expecting, when the anointed one comes, in the midst of that, something bad's going to happen in the temple. And that signifies the end. Do you understand that last statement? Yes, this means yes, this means no. Do you understand that last statement? Okay, good. Good, good. Because that, that in essence, is where Mark 13 picks up. Now, trust me, I'm not going to go in detail on Mark 13. But if you'll turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. Somebody give me the page number. 719. 719. Page 719 if you have one of ours. Starting in verse 14. Remember, they've asked the question, Jesus, you said the temple is going to be destroyed. When is this going to happen, and what is the sign? His first answer is, worry about today. But the second part of his answer starts in verse 14. He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong. Now, you'll notice it says, let the reader understand. Now, Jesus is speaking. This is his answer. So Jesus' answer is, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, they're automatically thinking Daniel. They're automatically thinking that a Gentile desecrating the temple. He's saying, you want to know when this is going to happen? When you see that happen, when you see somebody in the temple that defiles it, that makes it different than God, we don't know what that is. He doesn't, he, but, it, but they're there. They're in temple. Then you know what's going to happen. The interesting thing is this, is that in your Bible, if you have it, one of those Bibles where it's in red because Jesus is speaking, right? This, this sentence, let the reader understand. Well, Jesus didn't say let the reader understand because he's speaking. This is the one time that Mark, the writer, he's writing Jesus' dialogue. He stops and he says to the church in Rome now, understand this. This is it. You need to know this, you Gentiles. This part affects you. Understand, it's at this time that this happens. Are you following me? So then he goes on, and he describes this time. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, now this is all about as soon as you see this desolation in the temple. As soon as that happens... Your warning side should go off, and this should be your response. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of the house go down or enter the house to take anything out. In other words, do not delay. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. In other words, if, if, you're, if you're weak, if you're slow, you're in trouble because this is dire. I'm glad this didn't show up next week during women, uh, Mother's Day. All right. <laughs> Verse 18, pray that this will not play, take place in winter. It's going to be, in other words, it's going to be hard because those will be the days of distress. Now notice this, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world. 
This is, by the way, why it's important to note that this did not already happen. Somebody might come and say, hey, you know what, this already happened. And they might point you back to Antiochus, and they might point you back to the Nazis. But here's the, here's the key line. These will, days will be of distress unequaled from the beginning. We've had some pretty bad days. That been, then they, they don't seem to be getting better in a lot of ways. When God created the world until now, and they'll never be equaled again. In other words, this will be so bad, it will be the pinnacle of history. It will never get any worse. Verse 20, if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. That's how bad they are. Now, this here's the key, though. But for the sake of the elect, the elect, by the way, is you all. Those of you who are following Jesus. For the, for the, for the sake of, the, of his kids, they're the elect ones. Right? Imagine if you're, if you're in an orphanage, hundreds of kids, and two wonderful parents show up and they choose you. You're the elect. God's chosen you. And for your sake, for the sake of those that are in those days um, whom God has chosen, he has shortened them. That's why it's not going to be a, a, too long of a period. At that time, if anyone says to you, though, and then he has a warning, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ. And false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect if it were possible. In other words, they're going to be so convincing. They're going to, be so, they're going to look like the Messiah themselves. But God's true children will know better. And then he ends with 23. Be on your guard if I've told you everything ahead of time. Okay? Now here, this, the, I'm, just going to, I'm going to wrap it up really quickly. Are you ready? The Jews are expecting the anointed one. They're, they're looking for any morsel of hope, and of course they are. Why? Because there's chaos all around them. There's chaos all around them, and any little bit of hope, Messiah's coming, they're grabbing at. And of course, when the actual Messiah comes, they don't see him, even though he's right before them. And once again, the disciples, you know, they're they just latching on to the temple, the end. We want the Messiah to come. And they're thinking, Jesus, you're the one. When they say, when does this happen? What are, they gonna, what are the signs? They think there's 69 weeks. The Messiah shows up. And then there's seven years. At the end of those seven years, they're good. God's going to set up his kingdom. So all they want to know is they think that the... That, um, Jesus is going to establish his kingdom right then and there. They don't see any gap, parentheses, between the 69 weeks and the 70th week, between the 483 years and the last seven years. But there is. You know how we know there is? Because we're way past the seven years after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. We're waiting for that seventh week. But hear me, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's not the point. The point is this. Go back to verses 1 through 13. The point is, what you need to be worried about is not then. What you need to be worried about is the now. What's God's task for you? When that day comes, you will know it. You won't need to pay somebody to go to some conference or somebody who's going to sell you the latest book and that they can unpack all the prophets. It'll, it'll be clear. You will know it. You will know it because the, the, something's going to happen with the temple, whether it's going to be rebuilt or reestablished somehow, and then somebody who is not Jewish will show up and do the absolute opposite of what should be done in the temple. Until that day happens, relax. It ain't the day. And anyone who comes and tells you it's about to happen, you can shake your head and say, well, they've been saying that since Jesus. You're right, it is about to happen. Next year, next millennia, next. But when that happens, you'll know. But even in the midst of that, here's the beautiful part. This is what I don't want you to miss. Even in the midst of that, what is his message? You are precious. Even in the midst of that chaos, you are my people, and I love you. 
and I'm going to protect you. Now, you're going to go through it, not around it, not out of it. You're going to go through it. At least some of them obviously do. But know, know that you are my precious ones. And that's really what I want, I want you to leave with. You can go back and you, Daniel's interesting, especially when you, like I say, you read it with a book in one hand and a history in another and how that all lines up. It's really, really interesting. But it's really secondary to what I think the message here is. The message here is, is that in the midst of chaos, when everything's falling apart around you and it's really affecting you, you know how you respond? I'm elect. It's a good Jewish way of thinking, by the way. I am chosen. I'm God's precious child. You don't have to panic. Let me just give you a great Bay Area analogy. In 1989, the Niners were in the Super Bowl. There was three minutes and 20 seconds left on the clock, and we were losing. And we have time for one last drive. Everybody huddles up. Very first, they just get the ball back. They all huddle up. Joe Montana walks out, right? And Cool Joe says to his guard, hey, look, John Candy's in the crowd. And at that moment, everyone knew we're going to win this thing. Why? Because Joe was acting as if this ain't no big deal. We already won this, like he knew the future. Now, Joe didn't know the future. He was confident of the future, but he didn't know the future. But he did provide us with, this is exactly what should happen to us. When the finances are shaky, when the job is gone, when the world goes crazy, we can kind of go, and everyone else is panicking. Oh my goodness, this is not going to work out. America is going to go down, and the schools are going to be terrible, and my kids are going to get robbed, and, and all this, all this kind of all this stuff. We, we can just kind of stroll out and go, hey, look, there's the Father. We're his beloved. We're good. We're good. Because that's really the only thing that matters. So Jesus does give them one hint. The one hint is when it, the, the way you know when this is all going to come about, it'll be plainer than the nose on your face. But guys, in the midst of that, in the midst of that, don't worry. You're the elect. God's got your back. God's got your back. God has got your back. You're his precious children. You're the elect. Bad things are going to happen. Tough things. Some of them, you're going to be the cause of yourself. But one of the things the Bible does teach us over and over and over again, God understands that we're idiots. (laughs) And he loves us anyways. The criteria is is not not being an idiot. That's that's why Jesus came. You won't find idiot in the Bible. That's, That's my summation. God takes us just the way we are. He's got our back. He'll get us through because we're his favorite children. Let me just pray for us. Father, I know that was like drinking out of a fire hose. (laughs) And Lord, there was many words of Joel King in that, and I just pray by your spirit that's in folks that that may all be stripped down. That, that I pray that by the power of your spirit, your word may land on the good soil of our hearts and people may understand that you have a plan in the midst of the chaos. And we can depend on you. You are 100% accurate. You know the future before it even happens. And that at the worst of times, at the worst of times, we can be still and know you are our God and relax in the midst of chaos because we're your precious children. Would you make that not just head knowledge, but would you have that sink into our hearts? And the power in the name of the one who came, the anointed one who came, and then will return, I pray. Amen.
Amen. If you stand up, I'd like to bless you as you go out. First of all, you survived. Good job. That's a tough one. If you're a visitor, it's usually not that long and intense. And my blessing for you is simply this. You may not experience the eye in the storm. I know that's what we all want. Everything around us is crazy and we're all good. I pray that you experience the calm while you're in the storm. The calm of a loving father. The calm of knowing that you're, that you're loved and that you're cherished. And in the end, he'll work all things out to good for you. Go walk in the dust of our master, Jesus Christ. We'll see you all next week.